I am Paul Gewertz, a professor at Yale Law School, and I'm here today at Yale University Studios uh, with an extraordinary guest, Justice Stephen Breyer of the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, Justice Breyer was appointed to the court uh, in 1994 by President Bill Clinton. Prior to that, he uh, served on the faculty at Harvard Law School for many years, and after that, a judge on the United States Court of Appeals uh, in Boston, becoming its chief judge in 1990. And in between, he served in the Justice Department uh, as chief counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee, where he worked uh, in a leadership role in deregulating the airline industry. So he is someone who brings uh, to the Supreme Court extraordinary experience within government uh, and experience as a world-class scholar. Uh, and he is today, uh, in my judgment, uh, the most thoughtful of our justices. Um, he is a great judge, uh, and it is a tremendous privilege for us to welcome you to Yale University. And on behalf of the whole Yale community, Justice Breyer, we're, we're just really delighted you could, you could join us. Today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here, particularly when I get such a nice introduction. Well, thank <laughs> you. Uh, I thought I'd start with um, a very basic question, mm -hmm. which is what you think the American public uh, should know about the Supreme Court? What, what are the most important things uh, the public should, should know about the court? I, I'd like the public to know what we do. I think lots of people think that we randomly decide on the basis of whatever we happen to like, what cases we want to hear, and then we decide them the way whatever we think would be good. That would be a serious misimpression. Uh, the job of the Supreme Court Justice is to interpret the Constitution. That's part of it. It's a brief document that governs the country. And federal law, those are the laws passed by Congress, the statutes. Really, probably 85% of the law is made in the states and is not our concern. People don't understand that. I mean, about family law, most business law, most criminal law, education. These are state matters, primarily, and they don't concern us. We're not involved in that law. But we are involved in the laws passed by Congress and this document. Now, what should they know about this document? Well, it's fairly short, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> it has seven articles. It has 27 amendments. What does it do? Well, what I'd like people to see is that it doesn't tell us to tell everybody in the country what to do. Rather, it creates a framework for government. Those, it's a constitution. It constitutes a federal government. Now, what does that mean? In the seven articles, it tries to create a framework for a democratic kind of government a government where people decide, ordinary citizens, what kinds of rules they want for their community. It creates a Senate, a House of Representatives, a president. They're all now elected. The point is that individual Americans will decide themselves, for themselves, in their communities, their states, the nation, what kind of laws they want. That's not our job. Now, it's a special kind of democracy. It's a democracy that in addition to being democratic, guarantees basic rights. That's the Bill of Rights. It guarantees every citizen certain basic rights, like freedom of speech and so forth. It guarantees a certain degree of equality. It divides power and separates power, state, federal, three branches, so that no single group of people becomes too powerful. And it insists upon a rule of law. So it only takes me about 30 seconds. I can't do it in five seconds, but it takes about 30 seconds to describe this basic framework. Now, what is that framework? They are boundaries. That sets the boundaries beyond which government cannot go. Government cannot oppress an individual. It cannot deprive a person of free speech, fair trial, and so forth. It cannot go beyond the bounds of the powers that are set here. And we're the boundary patrol. That's and what we do. We're the boundary patrol. 
And as you look over the history of the court, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the leading examples of the court's most important decisions where it carried out that role for the good of the country? Well, sometimes you see the, uh, the virtue in that. I mean, when I say we're the boundary patrol, I don't mean the cases are easy. Life at the boundary and the frontier is sometimes difficult, and there are arguments. But within those boundaries, there are vast areas, huge, where people decide for themselves what kinds of communities they want. So you're saying, what are a couple of examples where they went beyond the boundaries? Well, the most obvious example where states and sometimes the federal government went well beyond the boundaries was when they had legal segregation in the south of the United States. They said black people go to one school, white go to another. Black people drink from one water fountain, white drink from another. And I can remember that time, and maybe you can, where there was a total separation of the races. Well, if you look at the document, it says here in Amendment 14, no state shall deny any person the equal protection of the laws. Oh, what? You looked at the South? All you had to do was look at those schools where black children went. They were shacks. And look at the ones where the white children went. They were much nicer. But even if they hadn't been different, even if they'd been the same, still the segregation was saying to black people in this country, there's a kind of badge of inferiority. And everyone knew that. They looked at the South. It was terrible. And in Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court said, read these words, equal protection of the law. Well, there are large numbers of Americans who are not getting equal protection of the law, and that is unlawful. Therefore, you will have schools that are integrated. You will not have schools that are segregated. And the whole legal system of segregation fell. It took a long time, but it began with a court decision in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. So if I had to pick one of your two, that would certainly be one of them. And at the other extreme, if you had to pick a mistake uh, the worst. in our constitutional <laughs> history, what would, what would you point to? Well, the general view of which is the worst, and I think this is a good candidate for the worst, was on the same issue, the issue of race. And it was before the Civil War. And it was, uh, the court made a huge error. Uh, no one knows quite why. Maybe they were trying to be political. But there was a man, Dred Scott, who was a slave. And he sued for his freedom. He sued for his freedom on the ground that he had lived in a free territory. He probably was right. Because at that time, before the Civil War, even though there was slavery, if a slave lived in a free territory long enough, he was free. The Supreme Court took the case. And it was terrible. They said, even assuming he's free, even assuming he's free, because he is the descendant of slaves, he's not a person, a citizen of the United States, and he can't bring a suit in this court. That was pretty bad. But it got worse. After that, they said that the laws that Congress has passed in order to prevent the spread of slavery, the Missouri Compromise, among others, that those laws violate the Constitution. And then it got worse because they said, if a slaveholder comes with his slaves into a free territory like New York or Massachusetts, that state cannot take the slave away from him. It's his property. The slave is his property. Human being, but a slave. My goodness, that was a terrible decision. And the dissent in that decision pointed out, where do you find that in the Constitution? Even the Constitution of the time, even before the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that stopped slavery. Where do you find that in the Constitution? Good question. I've read the opinion. It's hard to find an answer. And then people got terribly upset, in the North particularly. The New York legislature passed a, 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 did a, issued a report which said, my goodness, after this decision has become the law, what will happen is that that that, that slave driver with his manacled slave gang will come to the foot of Bunker Hill, the symbol of freedom, and will walk around with these people in chains. And you may be next. I mean, they were pretty annoyed and pretty angry. And the one good that came out of it 
is that Abraham Lincoln, holding in his hand the descent of Benjamin Curtis, gave a great speech at Cooper's Union and became the champion of the anti-slavery movement in America. The political champion obtained the nomination of the Republican Party for president and eventually, though after a terrible civil war, eventually slavery was abolished. But no thanks to, except in an ironic sense, no thanks to Dred Scott. I think that's generally viewed as the worst. So the two examples show a high point in the court's history and a low point. Uh, your lectures this week here are called Making the Constitution Work. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, it is an unusual thing in the history of the world. It has been a pretty unusual thing that nine unelected people who are judges will decide and have really close to final authority. You can amend the Constitution, but it's pretty hard as to what the meaning of this document is. Now, it's an extraordinary thing, too, what I see every day in the court. In the court in front of me, uh, in, those, in that room, I see every kind of person you can imagine. I see people of every race, every religion, every point of view. And they're there to resolve their differences under law. Hmm. Under law. Differences that they could be really angry about. I mean, think of how people feel about abortion. There are two sides, that, and they're very, very, very angry one side or the other about the position of the other side. What about prayer in schools? What about Bush versus Gore? People got very angry about those cases. And yet still, by and large, not always, but by and large, people will, perhaps grudgingly, complainingly, thinking that the court's totally wrong, but they will tend to follow the interpretation that nine people who are human and very fallible, what those nine people give, the interpretation they give of this document. Now, there's a virtue in that. And the virtue in that is a country of 300 million people, a very diverse country, with all kinds of different points of view, that in that country, those 300 million very different people, now we say 300 million people and 900 million opinions, the 300 million people will resolve their differences under law and not with guns on the street or through riots or throwing stones or sticks or bullets or tanks at each other. Now, that is a, an amazing, an amazing treasure. It's a, it's, a, it's a blessing for America. And I want to show people in that lecture yesterday that they cannot take that for granted. They never should take that for granted. It's something that has to be worked on that's gradually evolved over time. It's cost us a civil war. We've had 80 years of legal, legal segregation. That was this country. All kinds of things have gone wrong. And yet the history of this country is such that gradually one of its virtues is that these 300 million will decide things under law. And I wanted to show people enough so that they can see that that's important and that it has to be continuously worked on. And as a justice, what is it most important to keep in mind in order to make the Constitution work, in order to sustain that public trust over time, knowing that the court will, from time to time, issue decisions that people will disagree with? Well, t today I'm going to talk about that. I mean, I, I don't think, really, if you're going to maintain a world, a country, a nation with a court, and maintain a system where people do tend to follow the court, even where what they do say is unpopular and could be wrong. If you're going to maintain that, primarily, it's a function of the people of the country understanding the importance of it. So it's more a question of education, and it's more a question of, of uh, uh, learning something about politics in this country, about government, about how it works, about participation. It's more a question of those things than it is anything the court can do. But that doesn't mean the court can do nothing. The court, if it's going to be trusted, has to merit the trust. And to merit that trust, I think the court 
does not hold its finger up to the political wind. There would be no point in having a court if it just held its finger up to the political wind. Why do it? We have a lot of people in the country who are better politicians than the nine on the court. That would, be, that would be crazy. But rather what the court can do, I think, is to interpret the statutes in this document in ways that work for people who are living now. When I try to summarize that in a sentence, I say it's a question of recognizing that in this document there are values that do not change. The values are permanent. The value of due process of law, the value of free speech, the value of protecting against unreasonable searches and seizures. The values that are incorporated in this document are permanent, but how they apply, that's a different matter because life changes. So we have to apply permanent values to changing circumstances. That keeps this Constitution meaningful and protective for people who are alive today. Now, how to do that, how to make law work well without departing from the permanent value, how to make law work well for Americans today, well, that's the subject of what I'll talk about this afternoon. And in your time on the court, uh, it's more than 15 years at this point, uh, what, what is the case or two that stands out for you that most represents the court doing this job well and doing it importantly for the country? I hesitate because you don't know. I mean, Yogi Berra's statement's right. Supposedly, he said, I never make predictions, particularly not about the future. <laughs> and it's, it's really the future, you know, that will say whether we did our job right or not. I mean, things always look right to the people who do it. They always look right. Because if they didn't look right, why would they do it? I mean, it's, it's a question of what happens in the future and people looking back. I think and I hope that, that the people will, it will turn out that when you evaluate, if I had to pick one set of cases, I would say I think the Guantanamo cases were pretty important. And I hope that it will turn out that we got decided them correctly. Now, what happened in those cases, and there were four, is that the president, in each case, was being sued by a detainee, somebody who was detained in three of them at Guantanamo and in the fourth previously at the Guantanamo and he'd been moved. In each of those cases, the person who sued the president lost, a one, and the president lost. And in each of those cases, the court facing the issue in front of us decided in favor of the particular liberty that the individual detainee was advocating. But the opinions are narrow. The opinions don't reach too far because the court there is making an effort to safeguard the right of a very unpopular individual. One of them was Bin Laden's driver. I doubt there are many who are less popular than he. But he had a right to come into court. He had a right not to be tried, we thought, under the statute by a military tribunal given the law as it was then, and he won his case. We recognize at the same time it's the president who has authority to protect the nation in case of war or serious national security crisis. So it's an effort to weave a line. If the court goes too far and it ties the hands of a president in times of real necessity, it will be difficult for the country. But if it abdicates its responsibility and does nothing for an individual who's being deprived of a basic liberty, then why have such a court? What's it there for if not to protect individuals who, unpopular as they may be, are being deprived of a right to which they're entitled? I put so, the court to the test those cases, and we'll see how history evaluates. Well, certainly at the present moment, it appears that those cases illustrate the court holding on to law, protecting individual rights, doing it in a narrow way, as you said, and quite remarkably getting the public, including the President of the United States, to accept it. Uh, 
Okay, well, I, I think that when the court does its job, that the public will generally approve. Because even though everyone would like to have his or her way, normal, that's a normal part of the human condition. Yet I think people, when they stop to think about it, can accept an institution, the very point of which is to be independent, the very point of which is to decide under neutral principles of law to protect an individual, possibly even when that individual is very unpopular. I don't get my way today, but tomorrow that same law will protect me if I'm the unpopular one. People understand that. They know that's the basic point of the institution, and therefore I think there is support for it. And what do you think are the most serious problems facing the, the courts as a whole in American life, in playing that role, uh, both in ordinary cases and in big ones? I think the, the, the most serious problem is what I would call a, maybe a, a, a lack of interest to the point where people don't know and don't understand the judicial institution. And the reason that I, I fear that, <laughs> you know, if you meet an ordinary person, which I understand, who's not a judge, and you say, I'm a judge, and if they politely say, well, what do you do, and you try to explain it, they say, oh, that's very interesting, but actually they would have got to get back to the baseball game or, or whatever they're, they're, they're interested in. It's sort of dull to explain. <laughs> And complicated, and, but if enough people don't understand it, what they'll tend to think of, since we're people who make decisions, say, oh, they're sort of politicians. And once they think the judges are politicians, I think we're in trouble. Because if they think that, there won't be the ability. If they think it, they'll make them politicians. And if they make them politicians, there won't be the ability to protect that unpopular individual against a majority who's trying to tyrannize. And then the point of the institution is lost. I mean, quite honestly, I've said this, and certainly a lot of my colleagues have, and Sandra O'Connor spending a lot of time at it, it's really quite shocking that in many states where judges run for election, there are now huge campaign contributions from one group or another that favors this judge or the other judge to the tune of millions of dollars to get judges elected to the Supreme Court of a state. That's a dangerous situation because it creates a reality or at least the perception that these judges are politically beholden to one group or another to keep running for office, to collect the money, and once that perception catches on widely, you will not have an independent judiciary, which is bad for everyone. So thank you so much for coming. Well, thank Thanks you for talking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we're all very grateful.